All right, welcome back to another lesson. So my name is Zach, um, Jose Zacharias. I'm here to help you. If this is the EMT uh, class that you're taking, whether refresher or your first time, I'm here to help you out. I'm gonna be your assistant and welcome to my classroom. All right, so here I have some introductions. I have my bell, there it is. If you hear the bell a couple of times, that's important. This is a very important uh, information that will, you will see out there in the classroom, in your test as well, which is typical, typical, to there's thousands and thousands of exams. And these are the typical things that I, as an instructor, want to make sure that you understand it. So that's one. Number two, if you hear the bell two times, that means deuces. We see you in the next video. All right, just trying to keep it keep it going. All right, uh, what else, what else, what else, what else, what else? So today we're gonna look at a topic called medical legal, medical legal. So let me get back into it. So let me, let's, uh, let me set myself up here so we can go right into this video and presentation for you, okay? Now you have an option to stop, rewind, you know, this is all yours, this is free, this is, I wanna just give as much information to you so you can be the best EMT out there. You wanna be the one that's gonna help you when you have your patients and also to pass your exam as well as pass your course. So you can become a New York State uh, EMT, no matter what state you're from, what county you're from, but it's many states, but you wanna be the best, all right? For those who are there for the first time, welcome to this wonderful culture, all right? And um, also for my, my vets, my thank you for your service. All right, I know how it is out there in the streets, uh, wherever you're from. I just want to say thank you to you. Thank you, thank you, thank you for your services. All right, I always want to give a big shout out to my guys and girls and everyone out there to do the service that no one else will want to do. All right, and we get, oh, we see so much stuff. All right, we make a lot of difference in people's lives. We have stories and stories and stories. All right, let's get to it. So I'm set up here. Medical legal, this is what we're going to cover. So why medical legal is so important? Number one is because there's legal terminologies we need to understand, all right? That's going to prevent us from making the wrong decisions. There are guidelines that's going to help us. There are moments that we have to rely on our EPCR or PCR, and that's going to be the proof of what we provide our patients. So there might be a situation that we might go to court to testify on a particular call, which I've been there. All right. And so with that, we want to make sure everything is squared away. What what type of situations where we're going to meet, come across? Example, we might have someone who's suicidal. We might have someone in a, uh, a three-year-old that's sick and hurt. We might have a patient who is presented with something called a DNR. Or we might be presented with someone who doesn't want to go to hospital, but they should. So what are the, what are the, the terminologies for that that's going to help us? All right, so let's get to it. So now here, legal, legal, legal. Most of us pretty much, I don't know, vouch for you, but medical, medical legal is something we really want to deal with. We don't want to deal with the courts. We don't want to deal with lawyers. We don't want to deal with anything like, anything like that. But this presentation, this, this presentation will help you to understand it, to prevent you from going there. And if you do, your biggest, biggest, biggest thing that's going to help you if you happen to go to court to testify, is your PCR what you document? All right, document, document, document accordingly. All right, rule number one is do no harm. Don't do any more harm. They're already hurt. Just help them. All right, do no harm. So we're going to go into some terminology. One of the terminologies I like here is called consent, getting permission. Getting permission is one of the biggest things out there because when you meet someone, hey, how you doing? You know, can we go out? Yes. Hey, you know, can I open, you know, whatever it is, we ask for permission. We have to ask for consent. And it also applies in the medical world. All right. But one of the things too, is to get that permission. We have to have that patient who is mentally right here. They're conscious. They, 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 they are very competent. You know, they know what's going on. All right. Those are type, those type of patients. All right. They're alert, they're conscious, and they could do it. Because there are other, there's a flip side to that, where if they're not, then there's another type of consent. So express consent here is a powerful consent. This consent here is the patient acknowledges the treatment, right, or care and the transport. They already know. They know. They called you or the family called you. They're well aware of what, it, what they want. Asking them, can I help you? Asking them, can I take your blood pressure? Asking them, 
you know, all of these different things, and they themselves can give you that express consent. It can also be verbal. Yes, you can. Or nonverbal. Blood pressure. Or it's a nonverbal thing if they're not able to speak it. All right. So patient must be provided with informed consent. They need to understand the, why they're there. All right. Explain what's happening. Explain what the treatment can be. If they don't take the treatment, what are the risk factors? And if they do take the treatment or if they do to say yes, what are the benefits for them? So you have to be, you're the medical professional, you're the technician, and you have to inform the, these patients that we have that this is the right thing for you to do because we are our best, 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 best person for our patients. All right. Now we have me out of a long day. All right. Now, this is an example. So now let me ask you a question now. What position is this person in or what position I am? I'm in. All right. Medical, not 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 the, the lay person, the medical terminology, because now if you're new here, you got to know this. If more of my vets, you guys know. Right. It's prone. This is the prone position. So you have to assume that the patient wants consent. All right. If they're unconscious or altered mental status. All right. Unable to make an informed decision. If I'm unresponsive, like knocked out, all right, or intoxicated or overdose, all right, there's no way I'm going to give you some type of saying yes and then go back. No, that's not going to happen. So what you're going to do is you're going to apply, exactly, apply consent. You're going to assume that I, in the floor, prone, want consent. I need your help. All right. So these are other situations. Here it is. Oh, we got a little a little baby, right? So the little baby also is in this category. If patient's sick or something happens, if it's a, a minor, we have here in the fire truck here, we have a little uh, pediatric sitting on there, hurt, whatever it is. So we can treat the patient based on implied consent. Involuntary consent is not like you can come, but it's involuntary. So now we have different scenarios. So we have mental health, mental illness, behavior crisis, all right, patient going through crisis, through suicide, or any of those things that want to hurt someone, hurt themselves, or there might be someone that has a developmental delay, all right? You might have something that's artistic. You might have something who has mental uh, disability, all right? So there's a lot of different things that they cannot form, so we can take them involuntary, but again, we're doing this for the best of the patient, all right? So it's best to have PD on there. So you might have, you might even go to uh, correctional facilities. You might go to a prison. You might go to those places where you have prisoners. So all I'm going to say here is follow your local procedure based on your region, your state, all right, or wherever part of the world you're in. So these are just basic um, stuff that's going to be. So making those decisions there. So go to your procedures, whether state by state is a little different or your regional area and regional protocol, all right? But remember, it's a, a patient that's going through this. They can be taken here to see, be evaluated and to be treated at the hospital because we're, we're doing everything for the best of the patient. Now we're talking about minors. Minors are little ones, right? They're so cute. But there might be situations where the parents are there, the legal guardians there, okay? They are present there, making a consent. So... If the child is not there, for example, I had one call where the uh, child was crossing the street, leaving the school, got hit by a car. No one was there. No, you know, no family. We respond there and we use the consent. All right. We have the express consent and the implied consent. In that, we treat the patient, transport, we try to get a hold of the parents, but we're not going to wait on the scene for that parents to get there because it'll take them an hour to get there or 30 minutes to get there, 10 minutes to get there. But they can have best, their best bet is to just meet us at the hospital. All right. So police should definitely be involved. Police should definitely be there as well. But this is something that it, it's one of those situations. So you can have parents, legal guardians there. So let's look at some other issues or situations where the minor can give consent. Whoa. What do you mean by that? was called emancipated minor, emancipated minor or minors. So here it is, scenario number one. They're under the age, depending on the state, what's considered um, an adult. If they're under that age, they can be married. 
oh, I didn't know that. They can uh, definitely be part of the armed forces, right? Armed forces, the military, right? Even parents, they are minors, but they are parents as well. So you will see those things out there. You know, you're going to have those situations, but that's why you, as an emergency medical technician, you're a technician, you are also a detective trying to ask these information. And so those are things that you want to understand. All right, that's, all right, let me hit this bell. All right, that's one. That's one. You need to understand all the different consents. That's another one here. There it is. And based on the, the, the region or the state that you're in, you also have teachers. So teachers can also give that um, consent or school officials, all right? So again, you can check your local uh, procedures and policies in regards to those uh, things. Now, with also with minors, if there's a true, true, true emergency, all right, this little uh, girl here, she fell off her bike. So we are going to treat the patient, all right? Especially if it's a true emergency, there's significant where they can go down. In other words, they, they they can compensate very well, but when they go down in in, um, in shock, which I'll talk about a little later on, they can um, definitely go down the hill as far as the their condition. So we're going to go under the imply consent, imply consent, because again, she is a minor and there is a true emergency. Now there's another thing which is called forcible restraints. Forcible restraints. This is when we have a patient that can be very combative. So we might see, if you're new to this, you, we might see a lot of things as, as EMTs transporting the ambulance, sick and injured patients. But we also, we don't, I don't think they're, you're, you're aware of it, but we take care of patients uh, when there's mental disability, patients who are emotionally disturbed, mostly crisis, mostly crisis, or even combative patients. That can happen in many different ways, in different forms, where it can be a medical related. They can be violent because they're had low sugar, low oxygen, or they could just be very combative. All right. So one of the things I'm going to say here is you have to use your judgment. You have to look at the body language. And I think we spoke about that earlier with communication documentation, but you have to make sure that the police is on scene if you are and feel that you're not safe. All right. And then from there, there can be some situations that they can help you and assist you. So again, as you're entering a scene, you've seen this, you need to kind of go back to where you were. If you don't feel safe, find a place that's safe for you and call for police, all right? And let the dispatcher know the condition. So there's forcible restraint. So some of the techniques here is always you want to protect the patient's airway, all right? You never, ever, 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 ever place the patient in a prone position, face down. Don't ever do that. All right. Airway. Again, protect the airway. That's the key thing. Airway, airway. So this is a cavat, <laughs> a cavat or a triangle bandage. This is just, you know, one of many different knots. If, but again, call for your um, supervision or police, depending on your region, your state, you know, there's different uh, procedures with that. But one of the things I will say, if you find these situations where let's say police is on the scene, and the patient's prone, but again, you have to do right to your patient. So you want to keep them away from that prone position because they can actually die. There's been cases out there, and you want to do right for your patient. So you want to turn them the other side. You want to put them in a supine or sitting up, depending on the situation. But again, airway, 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 and document exactly what happened on the scene. All right, that's going to protect you and your patient. All right, so now we have a patient. I say, yeah, I'll go to the hospital. I'll go to the hospital. I'll go to the hospital. It's been a great day. I'm going to the hospital. The last call, I don't want to go to the hospital. What do you mean? You need to go. Well, here it is. Patients have a right to refuse. They can write to refuse on the care. They can write to refuse on the transport. I don't want to go. Simple as that. So how do we know that? How do, we, how do they fit this criteria of that? First, they have to be conscious. Number two, they have to be alert. Be an adult, all right, with a decision making capacity. They have to make the right, they need to know what's going on. They need to know what, what's going on. What, what are they? I know we talked about that in patient assessment. We have to do something called the AF proof, right? AVPU. They have to be alert with those questions that we said before. 
So here, they need to have the right to refuse. They can withdraw treatment or guess what? When in doubt, you can call for medical control. All right, medical control will be the physician. All right, you might have to make that call. You will make that call, but make sure when you make that call, you have all of the information documented. You have the patient's history. you got two sets of vital signs. You have everything because we don't make sure that they got the best of everything from you. And if they decide to not go, then the doctor can make that decision for you if you feel that that's the best for your patient. And it is. It will always be the best for the patient. All right. Ability to make an informed decision. These patients, they need to be able to make an informed decision. They need to know the person, place, time, and event. They need to understand the risk factor. They need to understand the, the, the benefits of your treatment. So you have to ask. And guess what? Repeat the question to see if they are there. So what's your name? Okay, good. And you know you have to go and find out that they are good up here. But when in doubt, you can definitely call for medical control. All right, so before you leave, before you just say, all right, you want to, okay, no problem. You have mes uh, mental capacity. They're alert. Everything's going well. They're fine. And guess what? All right. But again, encourage them. You sure? I think this would be the best thing for your best care. No? Okay. You can have the patient sign the PCR or EPCR and must, must have a witness, a family member, police, Whoever's on that scene that's part of this um, will give that showing that they refuse. We gave them every source. And again, when in doubt, you can call the medical director, the medical doctor, and let them speak. And I think that will be one of the best um, advice I can give you out there. And again, and again, and again, document, 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 doc I can say that a thousand times. Document. All right. Document that. There. Because that's going to help you. Because again, let's say something happens five years, 10 years from now, and then they're like, I don't remember that call. The best thing is to document that. Here's another situation. You have a patient who you gave them a oxygen device, a non-rebreather, 15, 10 liters per minute, right? 15 minutes, 15 liters per minute. And guess what? You did not document it. And according to the documentation, you never gave that to your patient and that can get you in trouble. Again, I'm moving towards communication, documentation, but that's something I just want to reemphasize that. So before you leave that house, just make sure, encourage them one more time, let them have, sign it, let them have a witness and document that to the T. Oh, you are going to run into patients who will be suicidal. Okay. Unfortunately, you will find the patients there already. In other words, they per, uh, pursue their thoughts and which killed themselves, which is a, another presentation. But the danger is not you. They're patients who might not want to live anymore. They don't want to live anymore, so they'll take anybody else out. So, so again, don't just run to these situations. Be very mindful for these situations. I've been in a number of calls where I approach my patient, not expecting it, but they're on the, um, the window, ready to jump out the window, let's say five stories, six stories. All right. So you got to be very calm, collective, and reassuring to them. In my particular case, I was very calm and um, concerned. No, ex you know, didn't bring any panic to the situation. Very calm and mellow until the police who was on the other side was able to grab the preteen who was out on the window ledge. And, you know, she made able to get out safely and we took her to the hospital for evaluations so these th things do happen police is definitely the people you want on the scene but again every situation is different um in a sense of scenarios well what if this what if that but it all goes to the same don't put yourself as in as a patient too all right seeing safety for you if you uh, send something call for police if anything and as things get a little too crazy call for a supervisor as well all right. Again, it depends on what state and what region you're in. You guys have your own policies there. Confidentiality. So now I'm going to say here, tell me if this is right. All right. So I have a patient here and I'm just speaking to the public now. I have the patient, right? Let's just say here, give you a scenario. I moved the patient out of the house or the apartment building and people ask me, hey, man, and I'm on the stair chair, you know, moving one patient to the, to the ambulance and they're asking me question. Hey, what happened? Well, yeah, this guy had a... Uh, uh, XYZ, 
And this is just the bystanders asking me that. Oh, yeah, he had a heart attack two, year, two years ago. He's taking this medication. He's allergic to this. Is that right? Is that right? And the answer is no. So there's a form of confidentiality. All right, confidentiality. We have to be, with this information is the patient's history, the assessment, and the treatment that we gave. No one should know that at all. Nobody. All right, unless we have backup unless we have someone that's going to uh, uh, assist us. BLS, another BLS unit, we can give them that information. ALS, paramedics, we can give them that information. We get to the hospital, we can give that information to the nurse and also to the doctors that they ask. So that's a very uh, important thing you need to understand. I'll do that for you. All right, so patient must sign a release of that information or there's a legal subpoena and also billing those are where that information can, can go out there for those purposes hipaa law hipaa law is the health insurance portability accountability act in 1996 basically again as i said before in the last slide it is patient privacy confidentiality protecting health information it does not only apply to emts it applies to the paramedics to the First responders that's dealing with patients' information, hospital settings, nurses, doctors, all the facilities there. It can be major, 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 major problems. All right, legally, civil or criminal. All right, now I'm going to go to official instructions. Official instructions. Now, what is the what is the medical terminology for official instructions? Very simple. It's called advanced going to the future directives instructions. All right. So these, this is a document where, I'll read it here so you can explain. It's advanced directive specific treatments should to, should the patient become con unconscious or unable to make a decision. For example, if I decide I want to have an advanced directive for me, I know I'm going through my stuff, but there are documentations that I want specific treatment. I don't want to be resuscitated. Don't put anything, no tube down my mouth. Don't do anything. I just want to be left alone when I die. So I want to specifically get a legal document that's going to request that. So if anything does happen to me, then you have the responders there and they're going to see it, read it, and they respect that. All right. So is a valid non-hospital DNR, do not resuscitate DNR order, is an advanced directive. So this is an example of one. And it gives permission not to resuscitate. Case close. So we have other advanced directives, such as a living will. Okay. We also have a health care proxy directive, which is also another type. Now, this is just New York. Uh, other states have it. New Jersey, Connecticut, Florida, Texas, California. They all over. They're different ones. And I want you to refer to the ones that you belong to. Okay. Just get familiarized with the terminologies, all right? So this is a proxy's directions that this requested by the patient. Now I'm going to explain to you uh, what is a DNR orders. So DNR orders is patients with medical problems, one more problems. It's a signature of the patient and a legal guardian and a signature of the doctor or healthcare provider. And it does not expire. However, in some states, you've got to go and look at your state to see which one applies to you, all right? So this, the DNR, is something that they refuse. I don't want to be resuscitated at all. So here we have the healthcare proxy directives and the living will. And for us, do we honor this? That's a question for you. I'll give you a few minutes to do that. All right, give you a second. Do we honor this, yes or no? And the answer is no, we don't honor this. However, they can, if you're in a the scene, they present this to you, they say, well, you can take those documents with you to the hospital, but we don't honor any of those uh, instructions there. But we do honor is this form here called the most form, M-O-L-S-T, the medical order, uh, orders for life-sustaining treatment, all right? That's what we honor in the field. So it's uh, several pages you see here on, on the screen. It's a interventions specific what they want requested. It's signed, and you also have it on, on online medical control. So this is more specifics. So question class, 
do we honor honor the do not resuscitate and malt form i know i'm speaking specifically to one state but in this case what we honor and the answer is correct we do all right so check your local state and see exactly what it is but for here we do honor the do not resuscitation all right a physical sign of death unfortunately 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 we are going to come across some situations. We're going to see the disease. We're going to see patients in something called cardiac arrest. In other words, they're dead. So we're going to look at some of the things. So now a physician determines the cause of death, the cause of death. They are the ones that's going to do that. Now, another thing I'm going to say here is, let me just see here. Another thing that's going to happen here is the cause of death. So presumptive signs. So these are the signs that you're going to see when we do that. All right. Unresponsive patients. Are they responding? A patient that does not have a pulse. Okay. Not breathing. No blood pressure. Cyanosis, just like the Smurf there, looking blue. Low body temperature. So these are all signs, signs of death. Keeping it simple, we're going to have decapitation. Decapitations where the head or mortal wounds are really significant. That is a sign of death. There's no way that this patient will uh, resume back to life. Dependent lividity, which is a pooling, settling in the lowest part of the body. So if they're laying prone, if they die or decease, then what happens, the heart's not beating. So if it's not beating, everything stops, fluid goes straight down to gravity, even if they're prone. And there's techniques in a sense of when you're assessing the scene and you look at the patient based on the dependent lividity of the pooling part, you can be able to see if they died like this. You might have situations where they're supine, but you see pooling on the front part of the body. And that doesn't make sense because it's just it doesn't make any sense. I mean, something was tampered, the patient was moved. So that's something you would note to the police. All right. This is your in document, those things. Rigor mortis is when there's a stiffening of the muscles. So your patients will become very, very, very rigid. So you were unable to move the joint or move the patient at all. It becomes very stiff. Then decomposition, which is the body's tissue, which is uh, happens 40 to six, uh, 96 hours after. And then they do form a aroma, a smell. All right, medical examiner here. All right, in some situations, you're going to go to something called a DOA, DOA, dead on arrival. So if you're going to go to a dead on arrival, again, you're thinking crime scene. All right, they call for you. You get there and figure out if this is more of a homicide or a suicide, and then you're going to document what you find on the scene. All right, and do not touch all of the evidence. Just minimize what you touch. Because again, this is a crime scene and you might need some information, but just be very cautious on that. And if you happen to move something, do something, then let the police know and they can document that. Going back to the medical examiner, the medical examiner is the one, depending on where you live and what state you live or what region you, um, you are in, there's different protocols, all right, in regards to leaving, removing, I mean, when I started the job, we used to remove the bodies to the morgue. So you got to find out based on where you um, teach or not teach. Um, uh, when you're there, then I want you to know your state and regional procedure. There it is. Procedure. Hey, all right. It's the unedited version. So here it is. So the medical identification. So bracelets, necklace, keychains card dnr orders you can find out this is where it says do not resuscitate and we honor those find out from your state exactly what's exactly what we honor as far as whether bracelet necklace uh keychains cards all right it's going to tell you not only medication medical identification it tells you the medical history all right the patient can be has seizures patient can have uh low sugar patient can have many different situations where when you get there they're unresponsive or altered mental status you look at the medical identification 
and look at the history. And that gives you a lot of clues. So don't miss this when you do your assessment. Scope of practice. Scope of practice, I call it a big circle. All right, the circle. So what is it? It's an outline of care. What care can you give as an EMT based on your state and as well as, well as medical director? What is your circle? In my circle, I can do patient assessment. I can do AED, BVM. Uh, I can, can give Norcan. I can give, I can splint. I can do all these different things. That's the standard protocol in, in standing waters and protocol based on a medical director. Now, if I decide to do a C-section, well, as an EMT, start to take, uh, let's say, IV, take some blood, that's out of what our training is. So whatever your, your EMT school is and whatever they are teaching for your state, your region, that's exactly what you're doing. You're not going outside of that training. I've came across um, first responders, EMRs, and some of the EMRs are paramedics. They're respiratory therapists. They are uh, combat medics from the military. And they have a lot more skills. But if once they are in that uniform, that's the level of what they're going to do. I hope that was pretty uh, simple. But if you go outside of that, there's going to be negligence and also some criminal offenses here. Standard of care. I have standards when I go to restaurants. I want to make sure in New York, we have a thing called a letter. That letter would be placed on the window before you go to, to, into the, um, the restaurant. I want to see the A's. And sometimes the C's are pretty good too. But I want to see the A's and the B's. I mean the A's. So those are certain standards of eating. Now, there's certain standards of training. All right. So what is it? So it is a degree of care that is a reasonable person with similar similar training would do in a similar situation. So if, if I have chest pains and EMTs come and treat me, I want to make sure that these technicians would do the right thing to give me the right treatment. I go to Florida or Arizona or even uh, the East uh, West Coast. I will hope if I have chest pains, they will do it as a similar training in a similar situation. So is a matter, here it is, standard of care is a matter in which you must act and behave. So the same way you give that treatment, it's the same way you do it anywhere else, all right? Concern about the safety and wellness of the patient. That's your number one thing, is your safety and wellness for their patient. That's number one. Now, how do we know about the standard of care? Well, the laws, right? Based on the law standards, it also gives us professional institutional standards like CPR guidelines, CPR guidelines change every five years. You need to know your standards. What is your training like? What is the textbook, your textbook? Everyone has different textbooks out there. Not only just one, there's many different textbooks. What does the textbook say? What is the, the NHTSA saying? What is the standard? All right, so stick within the standard of care, giving the best treatment no matter where you are and similar. So there might be some situations where there might be some different laws based on your state. Now, I'm on my ambulance, my rig, my truck, whatever you guys call it, and I'm with my partner, and suddenly we get respond to a call. It came over the computer. Now we're responsible for patient care. We have a legal, legal duty to act. That's called an act, duty to act, all right? Duty to act applies to once the ambulance responds to a call. We have a legal contract right now to take care of that patient. Things can happen. Patient could have left. They would have, another unit got there before you did. That would be a dupe job. It might also be a situation where, you know, the patient, uh, many situations, but once you are, you can get canceled. In other words, the dispatcher says, oh, disregard. And that's it. So that's a legal contract. All right. So once you begin that treatment, you have to do the treatment. All right. Once you begin it, that's it. It's a duty to act. Now, if you don't do these things, this is where it falls into this other terminology. I need to know this. Oh, there's a lot of things I miss. Forgive me. All right, is negligence. Negligence is a failure to provide the same care that the person with similar training would provide the same same thing. So it's the same as standard of care, but if we don't do the standard of care and do wrong, then there's a failure. You deviate it from your training. All right, so these are the four elements, all right, to prove negligence. Number one is a duty to act, all right, obligation to provide care. Then you did a breach of duty. You failed. You didn't give them the assessment you're supposed to. You didn't treat the patient the way you're supposed to. You didn't even transport the patient the way you're supposed to. There were damages because of what you did. The injuries which you did. 
And then you also have the injuries due to the EMT's breach of training. They failed to do it, and it caused injuries to the patient. With all that said, legally, with all those elements, will prove negligence. Now you get to the scene for another call. Get there. Hey, how you doing, sir? How's everything? Everything cool? All right, no problem. Have a good day. You don't feel well? All right, whatever. It's okay. And then you leave. You leave them there. <laughs> you just a, a bandit. You just abandon your patient, called abandonment. You terminate the care, all right, from the streets. And also, when you get to the hospital, once you get to the hospital, transfer to pay, transfer the patient to the stretcher, get a signature, you're technically transferring care to that facility, all right? Now, if you decide to say, ah, I'll leave you, no signature, I'll, I'll, that's you're going a whole different route. Terminologies here, we have assault, battery, kidnapping, all right? Assault is unlawfully un uh, placing fear to that patient or for immediate body harm. In other words, you better get in the stretcher, here's an example. You better get in the stretcher before I hit you with this oxygen tank. Assault. Battery. Bonk, right ahead. Unlawful touching of the patient. Assault and battery, example. You better get in that stretcher. If not, I'm going to hit you with this oxygen tank. Boom. Assault and battery. I hope you got that. Now we have a kidnapping. Kidnapping is also a part of abduction where the patient doesn't want to go. You still take them and they say no. And they're going back and forth. And you just take them not against their will. Taking them against their will. That's called kidnapping. There's a battery for bat hitting. All right, so here's another one. This is another one where we talk about false information, damaging reputation of a person. We have the sp spoken word. We have the written word. And also false statements is one, you know, it's, it's, it apply for more of the patient as well as even coworkers as well. Then we have the Good Samaritan immunity. And we have Good Samaritan. So Good Samaritan is basically... I have teach, teach a lot of people outside the EMS world, just the civilians on CPR first aid and things like that. And yeah, I, I just, I like to teach. I'll give you my testimony on why I love to teach so much. And I do it for free. That's why I'm here. I want you to be better. All right, it's a deeper message that I'm doing here. So Good Samaritan Law is acting out of good faith, all right, within your scope of practice. If you do something goes wrong with this individual, uh, giving actual care, then there is actually the Good Samaritan law that will protect the patient, uh, the people that went to go help out out of good faith. Gross negligence. Negligence is where we fail to do what the right thing is, and gross negligence is when you're willful, you, you're just want to reckless just do wrong to this patient. You're on the stair chair, there's a flight of stairs. You know what? They go down the stairs. You willfully, you willfully want to hurt this patient. Gross negligence. As I said in the last previous presentation, documentation, 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 what you see, very important. And last but not least, based on your protocols, your state and your region, this is something I want you to find out according to your region, your state is mandatory reporting requirements, okay? So here for us, we have something called the child abuse, child neglect, mal uh, treatment. All right, these are things as a mandated reporter, we have to um, report this. All right, so check out your local uh, state region and see where it applies to you, which are what our mandated re reports are for them. All right, so I hope that this uh, presentation was very helpful and i hope that this was uh, if you have any uh, questions comments you like share to other your classmates but whatever it is i'm here to help you because i want you to be the best emt out there and just below the description i got a couple of things that's pretty helpful in studying some uh, books or you know small books one is more on questions and the other one is more basic basic knowledge so just check the description below and just hit the link to make you better all right so have a, a good one. Deuces, I'm out. And have a good one. And be well, be safe out there. If you are EMT, be safe.
And if you're soon to be an EMT, make sure you continue to study and uh, be well, be safe. All right. So have a good one.